Hello and welcome, I'm Christopher Fitton and I'm reading out the first part of The Children of Odin by Patrick Collum. I have read parts of this book before, but I'm going to be reading out the full book because I love this story and I have upgraded my microphone and recording setup. I really hope you enjoy the tales of the Norse gods as I read the stories out in a bedtime story style. And let's begin. The Children of Odin, the Book of Northern Myths by Patrick Collum. Part 1 the dwellers in Asgard, far away and long ago. Once there was another sun and another moon, a different sun and a different moon from the ones we see now. Sol was the name of the sun and Mani was the name of the moon. But always behind Sol and Mani, wolves went, a wolf behind each. The wolves caught them at last, and they devoured Sol and Mani, and the world was in darkness and cold. In those times the gods lived, Odin and Thor, Hodor and Baldur, Tyr and Heimdall, Vidal and Vali, as well as Loki, the doer of good and the doer of evil, and their beautiful goddesses were living with them, Frigga, Freya, Nana, Iduna and Sif, but in the days when the sun and moon were destroyed, the gods were destroyed too, all the gods except Baldir, who had died before that time, Vidal and Vali, the sons of Odin and Modi and Magni, the sons of Thor. At that time too, there were men and women in the world, but before the sun and the moon were devoured and before the gods were destroyed, terrible things happened in the world. Snow fell on the four corners of the earth and kept on falling for three seasons. Winds came and blew everything away, and the people of the world who had lived on in spite of the snow and the cold and the winds fought each other, brother killing brother, until all the people were destroyed. Also there was another earth at that time, a green and beautiful one, but the terrible winds that blew leveled down forests and hills and dwellings. Then fire came and burnt the earth, there was darkness, for the sun and the moon were devoured. The gods had met their doom, and the time in which all these things happened was called Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods. Then a new sun and a new moon appeared and went travelling through the heavens. They were more lovely than Sol and Mani, and no wolves followed behind them in chase. The earth became green and beautiful again, and in the deep forest that the fire had not burnt, a woman and a man wakened up They had been hidden here by Odin, and left to sleep during Ragnarok, 
the twilight of the gods. Lif was the woman's name, and Lifrasir was the man's. They moved through the world, and their children and their children's children made people for their new earth, and of the gods were left Vadar and Vani, the sons of Odin and Modi and Magni, the sons of Thor. Of the new earth, Vadar and Vali found tablets that the older gods had written on, and had left there for them, tablets telling of all that had happened before Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods, and the people who lived after Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods, were not troubled, as the people in the older days were troubled by the terrible beings who had brought destruction upon the world, and upon men and women, and who from the beginning had waged war upon the gods. The Building of the Wall Always there had been war between the giants and the gods, between the giants who would have destroyed the world and the race of man, and the gods who would have protected the race of man and would have made the world more beautiful. There are many stories to be told about the gods, but the first one that should be told to you is the one about the building of their city. The gods had made their way up to the top of a high mountain, and there they decided to build a great city for themselves that the giants could never overthrow, the city they would call Asgard, which means the place of the gods. They would build it on a beautiful plain that was on the top of a high mountain, and they wanted to raise round their city the highest and strongest wall that had ever been built. Now one day, when they were beginning to build their halls and their palaces, a strange being came to them. Odin, the father of the gods, went and spoke to him. What dost thou want on the mountain of the gods? He asked the stranger. I know what is in the mind of the gods, the stranger said, they would build a city here, I cannot build palaces, but I can build great walls that never can be overthrown, let me build the wall around your city. How long would it take you to build a wall that would go round our city, said the father of the gods. A year, O Odin, said the stranger. Now Odin knew that if a great wall could be built around it, the gods would not have to spend all their time defending their city, Asgard, from the giants, and he knew that if Asgard were protected, he himself could go amongst men and teach them and help them. He thought that no payment the stranger could ask would be too much for the building of the wall. That day the stranger came to the council of the gods, and he swore that in a year he would have the great wall built. Then Odin made oath that the gods would give him what he asked in payment if the wall was finished to the last stone in a year from that day. The stranger went away and came back on the morrow. It was the first day of summer when he started work. He brought no one to help him except a great horse. Now the gods thought that this horse would do no more 
then drag blocks of stone for the building of the wall. But the horse did more than this. He set the stones in their places and mortared them together. And day and night, by a light and dark, the horse worked and soon a great wall was rising round the palaces that the gods themselves were building. What reward will the stranger ask for the work he is doing for us? The gods asked one another. Odin went to the stranger. We marvel at the work you and your horse are doing for us, he said. No one can doubt that the great wall of Asgard will be built up by the first day of summer. What reward do you claim? We would have it ready for you. The stranger turned from the work he was doing, leaving the great horse to pile up the blocks of stone. O father of the gods, he said, O Odin, the reward I shall ask for my work is the sun and the moon and Freya who watches over the flowers and grasses for my wife. Now when Odin heard this, he was terribly angered, for the price the stranger asked for his work was beyond all prices. He went amongst the other gods who were then building their shining palaces within the great wall, and he told them what reward the stranger had asked. The god said, Without the sun and the moon, the world will wither away. And the goddesses said, Without Freya, all will be gloom in Asgard. They would not have let the wall remain unbuilt, rather than let the stranger have the reward he claimed for building it. But one who was in company of the gods spoke, He was Loki, a being who only half belonged to the gods. His father was the wind giant. Let the stranger build the wall around Asgard, Loki said, and I will find a way to make him give up that hard bargain he has made with the gods. Go and tell him that the wall must be finished by the first day of summer and that if it is not finished to the last stone on that day, the price he asks will not be given to him. The gods went to the stranger, and they told him that if the last stone was not laid on the wall on the first day of the summer, not song or money, the sun and the moon nor Freya would be given him. And now they knew, that the stranger was one of the giants. The giant and his great horse piled up the wall more quickly than before. At night, while the giant slept, the horse worked on and on, hauling up stones and laying them on the wall with his great forefeet, and day by day the wall around Asgard grew higher and higher, but the gods had no joy in seeing the great wall rising higher and higher around their palaces. The giant and his horse would finish the work by the first day of summer, and then he would take the sun and the moon, soul and money, and fray it away with him. But Loki was not disturbed. He kept telling the gods that he would find a way to prevent him from finishing the work, and thus he would make the giant forfeit the terrible price he had led Odin to promise him. It was three days to summer time. All the wall was finished, except the gateway, 
Over the gateway a stone was still to be placed, and the giant before he went to sleep made his horse haul up a great block of stone so they might put it above the gateway in the morning, and so finish the work two full days before summer. It happened to be a beautiful moonlit night, Svladivari, the giant's great horse, was hauling the largest stone he ever hauled when he saw a little mare come galloping towards him. The great horse had never seen so pretty a little mare, and he looked at her with surprise. Slutty fairy, slave, said the little mare to him, and went frisking past. Svladivari put down the stone he was hauling and called to the little mare. She came back to him. Why do you call me Svladivari slave? said the great horse. Because you have to work night and day for your master, said the little mare. He keeps you working, working, working and never lets you enjoy yourself. You dare not leave that stone down and come play with me. Who told you I dare not to do it? said Svladivari. I know you daren't do it, said the little mare, as she kicked up her heels and ran across the moonlit meadow. Now the truth is that Svladivari was tired of working day and night. When he saw the little mare so galloping off, he became suddenly disconnected. He left the stone he was hauling on the ground. He looked round and he saw the little mare looking back at him. He galloped after her. He did not catch up to the little mare. She went on swiftly before him. On she went over the moonlit meadow, turning and looking back now and again at the great Svladifari, who came heavily after her. Down the mountainside the mare went, and Svladifari, who had now rejoiced in his liberty and in the freshness of the wind and in the smell of the flowers, still followed her. With the morning's light, they came near a cave, and the little mare went into it. They went through the cave, then Svladifari caught up on the little mare, and the two went wandering together. The little mare telling Svladifari stories of the dwarves and the elves. They came to a grove, and they stayed together in it, the little mare playing so nicely with him that the great horse forgot all about time passing. And while they were in the grove, the giant was going up and down, searching for his great horse. He had come to the wall in the morning, expecting to put the stone over the gateway and so finish his work, but the stone that was to be lifted was nowhere near him. He called for Sladifari, but his horse did not come. He went to search for him, and he searched down the mountainside. He searched as far as the earth as the realm of the giants, but he could not find Sladifer. The gods saw the first day of summer come, and the gateway of the wall stand unfinished. They said to each other that if it were not finished by the evening, they need not give soul and money to the giant nor the maiden Freya to be his wife. 
The hours of the summer day went past and the giant did not raise the stone over the gateway. In the evening he came before them. Your work is not finished, Odin said. You forced us to a hard bargain and now we need not keep it with you. You shall not be given soul and money, nor the maiden Freya. If the wall I had built was not so strong, I would tear it down, said the giant. He tried to throw down one of the palaces, but the gods laid hands on him and thrust him outside the wall he had built. Go and trouble Asgard no more, Odin commanded. Then Loki returned to Asgard. He told the gods how he had transformed himself into a little mare and had led away Svladifari, the giant's great horse. And the gods sat in their golden palaces behind the great wall and rejoiced that their city was now secure and that no enemy could ever enter it or overthrow it. But Odin, father of the gods, as he sat upon his throne, was sad in his heart. Sad that the gods had got their wall built by a trick, that oaths had been broken, and that a blow had been struck in injustice in Asgard. Iduna and her apples, how Loki put the gods in danger. In Asgard there was a garden, and in that garden there grew a tree, and on that tree there grew shining apples. Thou knowest, O well-loved one, that every day that passes makes us older and brings us to that day when we will be bent and feeble, grey-headed and weak-eyed. But those shining apples that grew in Asgard, they who ate of them every day grew never a day older, for the eating of the apples kept old age away. Iduna the goddess tended the tree on which the shining apples grew, None would grow on the tree unless she was there to tend it. No one but Iduna might pluck the shiny apples. Each morning she plucked them and left them in her basket. And every day the gods and goddesses came to her garden that they might eat the shiny apples and so stay forever young. Iduna never went from her garden. All day, every day, she stayed in the garden or in her golden house beside it. And all day, every day, she listened to Bragi, her husband, tell a story that never had an end. Oh, but a time came when Iduna and her apples were lost to Asgard, and the gods and goddesses felt old age approach them. How all that happened shall be told thee, O well beloved. Odin, the father of the gods, often went into the land of men to watch over their doings. Once he took Loki with him, Loki the doer of good and the doer of evil. For a long time they went travelling through the world of men. At last they came near Jotunheim, the realm of the giants. It was a bleak and empty region. There were no growing things there, not even trees with berries. There were no birds, there were no animals, as Odin the father of the gods 
and Loki, the doer of good and the doer of evil, went through this region, hunger came upon them. But in all the land around, they saw nothing they could eat. Loki, running here and running there, came at last upon a herd of wild cattle. Creeping up on them, he caught hold of a young bull and killed him. Then he cut up the flesh into strips of meat. He lighted a fire and put the meat on spits to roast. While the meat was being cooked, Odin, the father of the gods, a little way off, sat thinking on the things he had seen in the world of men. Loki made himself busy, putting more and more logs on the fire. At last he called to Odin, and the father of the gods came and sat down near the fire to eat the meal. But when the meat was taken off the cooking spits, and when Odin went to cut it, he found that it was still raw. He smiled at Loki for thinking the meat was cooked, and Loki troubled that he had made a mistake, put the meat back and put more logs upon the fire. Again Loki took the meat off the cooking spits and called Odin to the meal. Odin, when he took the meat that Loki brought him, found that it was as raw as if it had never been put upon the fire. Is this a trick of yours, Loki? he said. Loki was so angry at the meat being uncooked that Odin saw he was playing no tricks. In his hunger he raged at the meat and he raged at the fire. Again he put the meat on the cooking spits and put more logs on the fire. Every hour he would take up the meat, sure that it was now cooked and every time he took it off Odin, he would find that the meat was as raw as the first time they put it off the fire. Now Odin knew that the meat must be under some enchantment by the giants. He stood up and went on his way, hungry but strong. Loki, however, would not leave the meat, that he had put back on the fire. He would make it to be cooked, he declared. He would not leave the place hungry. The dawn came, and he took up the meat again. As he was lifting it off the fire, he heard a whir of wings above his head. Looking up, he saw a mighty eagle, the largest eagle that ever appeared in the sky. The eagle circled round and round, and came above Loki's head. Canst thou not cook thy food? The eagle screamed to him. I cannot cook it, said Loki. I will cook it for thee, if thou wilt give me a share, screamed the eagle. Come then and cook it for me said Loki. The eagle circled round until he was above the fire, then flapping his great wings over it, he made the fire blaze and blaze. A heat that Loki had never felt before came from the burning logs. In a minute he drew the meat from the spits and found it was well cooked. My share, my share, give me my share, the eagle screamed at him. He flew down, seizing a large piece of meat, instantly devouring it. He seized on another piece. Piece after piece he devoured, until it looked as if Loki would be left with no meat for his meal. As the eagle seized on the last piece, 
Loki became angry indeed. Taking up the spit on which the meat had been cooked, he struck at the eagle. There was a clang as if he had struck some metal. The wood on the spit did not come away. It stuck to the breast of the eagle. But Loki did not let go his hold on the spit. Suddenly the eagle rose up in the air. Loki who held to the spit that was fastened to the eagle's breast was drawn up in the air. Before he knew what had happened, Loki was miles and miles up in the air and the eagle was flying with him towards Jotunheim, the realm of the giants. And the eagle was screaming out, Loki, friend Loki, I have thee at last. It was thou who didst cheat my brother of his reward for building the wall round Asgard. But Loki, I have thee at last. Now know that Diasi, the giant, has captured thee, O Loki, most cunning of the dwellers in Asgard. Thus the eagle screamed as he went flying with Loki towards Jotunheim, the realm of the giants. They passed over the river that divides Jotunheim from Midgard, the world of men, and now Loki saw a terrible place beneath him, a land of ice and rock. Great mountains were there, they were lighted by neither sun nor moon, but by columns of fire thrown up now and again through cracks in the earth, or out of the peaks of the mountains. Over a great iceberg the eagle hovered, suddenly he shook the spit from his breast and Loki fell down on the ice. The eagle screamed out to him, Thou art in my power at last, O thou most cunning of all the dwellers in Asgard. The eagle left Loki there and flew within a crack in the mountain. Miserable indeed was Loki upon that iceberg. The cold was deadly, he could not die there for he was one of the dwellers in Asgard, and death might not come to him that way. He might not die, but he felt bound to that iceberg with chains of cold. After a day his captor came to him, not as an eagle this time, but in his own form, Tiasi the giant. Wouldst thou leave thine iceberg, Loki, he said, and return to thy pleasant place in Asgard? Thou dost delight in Asgard, although only by one half dost thou belong to gods. Thy father, Loki, was the wind giant. Oh, that I might leave this iceberg, Loki said, with the tears freezing on his face. Thou mayest leave it when thou showest thyself ready to pay thy ransom to me, said Tiasi. Thou wilt have to get me the shiny apples that Iduna keeps in her basket. I cannot get Iduna's apples for thee, Tiasi, said Loki. Then stay upon the iceberg, said Tiasi the giant. He went away and left Loki there, with the terrible winds chilling him as with blows of a hammer. When Tiasi came again and spoke to him about ransom, Loki said, There is no way of getting the shining apples from Eduna. There must be some way, O cunning Loki, said the giant. Iduna, although she guards well the shining apples, is simple-minded, said Loki. It may be that, 
I shall be able to get her to go outside the wall of Asgard. If she goes, she will bring her shining apples with her, for she never lets them go out of her hand, except when she gives them to the gods and goddesses to eat. Make it so that she will go beyond the wall of Asgard, said the giant. If she goes outside of the wall, I shall get the apples from her. Swear by the world tree that thou wilt lure Iduna beyond the wall of Asgard. Swear it, Loki, and I shall let thee go. I swear it by Yggdrasil, the world tree that I will lure Iduna beyond the wall of Asgard, if thou wilt take me off this iceberg, said Loki. Then Tiasi changed himself into a mighty eagle, and taking Loki in his talons, he flew him over the stream that divides Jotunheim and the realm of the giants from Midgard, the world of men. He left Loki on the ground of Midgard, and Loki then went on his way to Asgard. Now Odin had already returned, and he had told the dwellers in Asgard of Loki's attempt to cook the enchanted meat. All laughed to think that Loki had been left hungry for all his cunning. Then when he came into Asgard, looking so famished, they thought it was because Loki had had nothing to eat. They laughed at him more and more, but they brought him into the feast hall and they gave him the best food, with wine out of Odin's wine cup. When the feast was over, the dwellers in Asgard went to Iduna's garden as was their wont. There sat Iduna in the golden house that opened on her garden. Had she been in the world of men, everyone who saw her would have remembered their own innocence, seeing one who was so fair and good. She had eyes blue as the blue sky, and she smiled if she was remembering lovely things she had seen or heard. The basket of shining apples was beside her. To each god and goddess, Iduna gave a shining apple. Each one ate the apple given, rejoicing to think that they would never become a day older. Then Odin, the father of the gods, said the runes that were always said in praise of Iduna, and the dwellers in Asgard went out of Iduna's garden, each one going to his or hers own shining house. All went except Loki, the doer of good and the doer of evil. Loki sat in the garden, watching fair and simple Iduna. After a while, she spoke to him and said, Why dost thou still stay here, wise Loki? To look well on thine apples, Loki said. I am wondering if the apples I saw yesterday were really as shining as the apples that are in thy basket. There are no apples in the world as shining as mine, said Iduna. The apples I saw were more shining, said Loki. Aye, and they smelled better, Iduna. Iduna was troubled at what Loki whom she deemed so wise told her. Her eyes filled with the tears that there might be more shining apples in the world than hers. 
Oh, Loki, she said, it cannot be. No apples are more shining, and none smell so sweet as the apples I pluck off the tree in my garden. Go then and see, said Loki. Just outside Asgard is the tree that has the apples I saw. Thou, Iduna, dost never leave thy garden, and so thou dost not know what grows in the world. Go outside of Asgard and see. I will go, Loki, said Iduna, the fair and simple. Iduna went outside the wall of Asgard. She went to the place Loki had told her that the apples grew in. But as she looked this way and that way, Iduna heard a whir of wings above her. Looking up, she saw a mighty eagle, the largest eagle that had ever appeared in the sky. She drew back towards the gate of Asgard, then the great eagle swooped down. Iduna felt herself lifted up, and then she was being carried away from Asgard. Away, 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 over Midgard, where men lived, away toward the rocks and snows of Jotunheim, across the river that flows between the world of men and the realm of the giants, Iduna was born, and the eagle flew into a cleft in a mountain, and Iduna was left in a cavernous hall, lighted up by the columns of fire that burst up from the earth. The eagle loosened his grip on Iduna, and she sank down on the ground of the cavern. The wings and the feathers fell from him, and she saw her captor as a terrible giant. Oh, why have you carried me off from Asgard and brought me to this place? Iduna cried, that I might eat your shining apples. Iduna, said Thiassi the giant, that will never be, for I will not give them to you, said Iduna, give me the apples to eat, and I shall carry you back to Asgard, said Thiassi, no, no, that cannot be, I have been trusted with the shining apples, that I might give them to the gods only. Then I shall take the apples from you, said Thiassi the giant. He took the basket out of her hands and opened it, but when he touched the apples, they shriveled under his hands. He left them in the basket, and he set the basket down for he knew now that the apples would be no good to him unless Iduna gave them to him with her own hands. You must stay here with me until you give me the shining apples, he said to her. Then was poor Iduna frightened. She was frightened of the strange cave and frightened of the fire that kept bursting about of the earth, and she was frightened of the terrible giant, but above all she was frightened to think of the evil that would fall upon the dwellers in Asgard, if she were not there to give them the shiny apples to eat. The giant came to her, again, but still Iduna would not give him the shining apples, and there in the cave she stayed, the giant troubling her every day, 
and she grew more and more fearful as she saw in her dreams the dwellers in Asgard go to her garden, go there and not being given the shining apples, feel and see a change coming over themselves and over each other. It was as Iduna saw in her dreams, every day the dwellers in Asgard went to her garden, Odin, Thor, Hodor and Baldur, Tyr and Heimdall, Vidar and Vali, with Frigga, Freya, Nana and Sif, there was no one to pluck the apples off their tree, and a change began to come over the gods and goddesses, they no longer walked lightly, their shoulders became bent, their eyes no longer were as bright as dewdrops, and when they looked upon one another, they saw the change, age was coming upon the dwellers in Asgard, they knew that the time would come when Frigga would be grey and old, when Sif's golden hair would fade, when Odin would no longer have his clear wisdom, and when Thor would not have strength enough to raise and fling his thunderbolts, and the dwellers in Asgard were saddened by this knowledge, and it seemed to tell them all brightness had gone from their shining city, where was Aduna, whose apples would give back youth, strength and beauty to the dwellers in Asgard, the gods had searched for her through the world of men, no trace of her did they find, but now Odin, searching through his wisdom, saw a means to get knowledge of where Iduna was hidden, he summoned his two ravens, Hugin and Munin, his two ravens that flew through the earth and through the realm of the giants, and they knew all things that were past and all things that were to come, he summoned Hugin and Munin, and they came and one sat on his right shoulder, and one sat on his left shoulder, and they told him deep secrets, they told him of Thiasi, and of his desire for the shiny apples that the dwellers in Asgard ate, and of Loki's deception of Iduna, the fair and simple. What Odin learnt from his ravens was told in the council of the gods, then Thor the strong went to Loki and laid his hands upon him, when Loki found himself in the grip of the strong god, he said, what wast thou with me O Thor, I would hill thee into a chasm in the ground, and strike thee with my thunder, said the strong god, it was thou who didst bring it about that Iduna went from Asgard, O oh, Thor, said Loki, do not crush me with thy thunder, let me stay in Asgard, I will strive to win Iduna back, the judgment of the gods, said Thor, is that thou, the cunning one, shouldn't go to Jotunheim, and by thy craft win Iduna back from the giants, go or else I shall hurl thee into a chasm and crush thee with my thunder, I will go, said Loki, from Frigga, the wife of Odin, Loki borrowed the dress of falcon feathers 
that she owned. He clad himself in it and flew to Jotunheim in the form of a falcon. He searched through Jotunheim until he found Thiassi's daughter Skadi. He flew before Skadi and he let the giant maid catch him and hold him as a pet. One day the giant maid carried him into the cave where Iduna the fair and simple was held. When Loki saw Iduna there, he knew that part of his quest was ended. Now he had to get Iduna out of Jotunheim and away to Asgard. He stayed no more with the giant maid, but flew up into the high rocks of the cave. Skadi wept for the flight of her pet, but she ceased to search and to call and went away from the cave. Then Loki, the doer of good and the doer of evil, flew to where Iduna was sitting and spoke to her. Iduna, when she knew that one of the dwellers in Asgard was near, wept with joy. Loki told her what she was to do, by the power of a spell that was given him, he was able to change her into the form of a sparrow, but before she did this, she took the shining apples out of her basket and flung them into places where the giant would never find them. Skadi, coming back to the cave, saw the falcon fly out with a sparrow beside him. She cried out to her father, and the giant knew that the falcon was Loki, and that the sparrow was Iduna. He changed himself into the form of a mighty eagle. By this time, Sparrow and Falcon were out of sight, but Thiassi, knowing that he could make better flight than they, flew towards Asgard. Soon he saw them. They flew with all the power they had, but the great wings of the eagle brought him nearer and nearer to them. The dwellers in Asgard, standing on the wall, saw the falcon and the sparrow with a great eagle pursuing them. They knew who they were, Loki and Iduna with the Asi in pursuit. As they watched the eagle winging nearer and nearer, the dwellers in Asgard were fearful that the falcon and the sparrow would be caught upon, and that Iduna would be taken away by Thiassi. They lighted great fires upon the wall, knowing that Loki would find a way through the fires, bringing Iduna with him, but that Thiassi would not find a way. The falcon and the sparrow flew towards the fires. Loki went between the flames and brought Iduna with him, and Thiassi, coming up to the fires and finding no way through, beat his wings against the flames. He fell down from the wall, and the death that came to him afterwards was laid to Loki. Thus Iduna was brought back to Asgard. Once again, she sat in the golden house that opened to her garden. Once again she plucked the shining apples of the tree. She tended and once again 
she gave them to the dwellers in Asgard, and the dwellers in Asgard walked lightly again, and brightness came into their eyes, and into their cheeks, age no more approached them, youth came back, light and joy were again in Asgard. <laughs>